now, and we're going to let you take it away. Okay, well, very nice to meet all of you guys. I'm going to give a talk on plasmalogens and neurology and aging and death, basically. And it goes in many different categories. I'm going to focus on, because plasmalogens are kind of a story that most people don't get a chance to get experience of. And I'll be having different talks later this year that'll talk more about early childhood development, myelination, um, and how that interacts. Basically, the same thing happens to us late in life. But what I want to go through is kind of the big hammer issues, and then feel free to interrupt and discuss as we go. Um, recording is good because it gives you guys some, um, there's usually pretty information um, intense work um, on this. So let me get to the beginning of this thing. Whoop, well, that doesn't help much. Let me. Going backwards is not usually the easiest thing to do. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is plasmalogen therapy, cognition and mobility. Um, obviously things that are important. They also have a big important component to inflammation that you'll you'll be interested to know about malondialdehyde, catalase function, and so on. And it's about longevity and maintaining function as we go forward. So my background is actually in psychiatric medicine. I'm also a synthetic organic chemist. And over the last 30 years or so, I've been focusing on the biochemical mechanisms of disease. So as I learn more, I, I tend to learn more and more how stupid I was younger, and I'm trying to get a bit more intelligent as I, as I get older but we learn from just empirical data. I uh, invented a technology called non-targeted metabolomics, and this is what allowed me to look into the biochemistry in much greater detail. And then, because I'm a chemist, we dealt with biochemical restoration molecules, and plasmalogen precursors are a critical component of that. And a lot of diagnostics um, in terms of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancers, and so on. Wrote a book last year, still very relevant in Alzheimer's, goes through that in great detail. Some of that I'll go through today. And then I have a company called Protome Sciences where we do blood testing and supplements. And then we've just opened up the research institute here in Temecula where we're doing much more uh, clinical trial work and um, case study work with, with, with doctors. So a lot of education. So that's kind of a background. So the book is in pretty good detail. It's written from both a lay person, but also a scientist but detailed lectures on the different components of, um, of uh, Alzheimer's neurology pathology as aging is there. So it's kind of a deep down the rabbit hole as you wish to go. So the goal here is to learn how the loss of membrane integrity. And we kind of, we take a lot of basics for granted. There's two things I talk about a lot of is the energetic balance, like the body, um, generates energy. It, it uh, burns hydrocarbons into carbon dioxide and water and uses that energy to charge a battery called our electron transport chain. And that is a critical core component. The other one is membrane structure. It's what gives the body its compartmentalization, it separates our heart from our lungs, from our brain, but it also gives us compartmentalization in our cells. And sometimes we take this for granted, but it's a core component of, of health. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And so the issue here is um, some cold, hard facts about brain health and death. Because as our brain goes, basically our survival goes as well. The, um, when we talk about dementia, we a lot of it gets grouped into this Alzheimer's and related dementia. But dementia is a, it's, it's a symptomatic phase. It's measured by performance my memory, my executive function, you know, orientation with space and time. And the symptoms of dementia are very, very similar, regardless of whether it's an Alzheimer's type or a vascular type or Lewy body or frontal temporal lobe. Frontal temporal lobe have slight nuances, but dementia is fundamentally um, reduced mental functioning. And so we've done a lot of long research. And so this is a clinical trial for Rush University in Chicago. and it's a uh, quite a large study. So we measured almost 9,000 blood samples over the course of about 14 years. And if you take a look at the last six years from the last clinical visit, it's been going on many, many years. 
we go backwards in time, how many people are still living, how many people have died, post-mortem analysis, and so on. And we get a final data set of 1,262 subjects. And this is what it breaks out to, where we have two blood samples taken um, in these individuals in which the average time between the blood samples was 3.7 years. And then we have a certain amount of people with clinical dementia. The average age in this group was quite 81 years old, visit one, 85 years old, and visit two. And we look at just simply the prevalence of dementia cross-sectionally within this cohort of individuals based upon the blood le levels of plasmalogens in their blood. And plasmalogens are these essential fossil lipids that are part of membrane structure. Um, it's also a critical component of premature babies. Uh, it's involved in plasmalogen of breastfeeding. It's one of the highest concentrations of plasmalogens in our world is in humans' breast milk. Um, it's, not, it's not present in um, cow's milk. So this is also a high issue with um, breastfed babies versus formula-fed babies. But here, each standard deviation, each bar represents the standard deviation of the population. So this is the frequency, 600 people, 400, 200. So it's not a small study. And this is the percent of dementia in, that co in this bar relative to their plasmalogen levels. And you can see with each increasing level of plasmalogens, the percent dementia in that population decreases, such that those with high levels of plasmalogens have very low rates of dementia. And those with low levels of plasmalogens have very high rates. And if you plot this probability of dementia over the course of their age, you get these three lines. People with high plasmalogens, the top 10%, versus the lowest 10%, versus the median. And what you'll notice is that a 95-year-old with high plasmalogens has the same probability of dementia as a 75-year-old with low plasmalogens. So we're dealing with a 20-year differential in mental health of these individuals based upon a critical lipid that goes into our brain and our rest of our body, our lungs and our heart and so on. The trick with plasmalogens is that we get very little of them from our diet, most almost entirely synthesized internally. And if we look at this transition from those individuals that visit one that had no dementia, so there were 77 with dementia and then 226. So we had these 149 new cases of dementia in this 3.7 year follow-up in this elderly population. Well, the transition, the probability that a non-demented person will become demented in the next 3.7 years is also highly dependent. Okay, it's 20 year difference. Okay, so the probability that a 95 year old that has no dementia will become demented in the next 3.7 years, okay, if they have high levels of plasmalogens versus the low levels, again, it's a 20 year differential. And when we plot this, we get rid of anyone who had dementia at baseline and say, okay, we track these individuals for six years. What is the Kaplan-Meier graph? And this is those that are in the top 15% roughly. Okay, there's um, 123 subjects here. It's basically flat line. None of these individuals get dementia versus the rest of the population shows it here. And this is a comparison of a high plasmalogen versus the rest of the population versus the three genotypes, okay, APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. So the most powerful genetic risk factor of almost any disease that we measure is this presence of the APOE4 genotype. And you can see the negative effect of the APOE4 is small in comparison to the positive effect of high levels of plasmalogen. And if we look, it's an 80% lower rate of dementia based upon the plasmalogen levels in their blood. Highly statistically significant. And if we look at this serendipity, like I wasn't planning on looking at this in detail, but since we had this study, it's been going on a long time. Um, since the study ended, 557 subjects had now since passed away. So we can actually look at all-cause mortality. Now, this is the probability of dying in the next 5.3 years. After correcting for cognition and the, the risk of cognition and mortality. And you can see it's even more striking. 
So the plasmalogen association, what I'm going to discuss in terms of mental health, also affects other systems because the all-cause mortality difference is actually greater than the cognition difference. And so that an 80, if you look at 85-year-olds, an 85-year-old with high plasmalogens, okay, had almost had more than an 80% chance of making it to their 90th, 90th birthday. Whereas an 85-year-old with low plasmalogens had about a 70% chance of dying in the next five years. And so this is a pretty, these error bars here are 95% confidence intervals. And so the take home message here is clearly that these plasmalogens are, are related to some core physiological components of human life. And if we look into the brain, so that, those, that's all measuring plasmalogen levels in the blood. But if we do post-mortem analysis in individuals that we had very strong um, cognitive status prior to their death. And so we have 100 individuals here. We're looking at the temporal cortex. And these are individuals that prior to their death that they had their cognitive status and no cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. We have the pathology using the Brock scale as well as, as a CRAD scale. And you can see they're quite evenly distributed. Did pretty comprehensive analysis of the biochemistry of these brain samples. And what happened is that the association between the levels of plasmalogens in the brain and cognitive status is quite strong. So this is the difference between low plasma, low brain levels of DHA plasmalogens, the omega-3 version. Okay, this is this is DHA, this is arachidonic acid, linoleic, and oleic. And we see this very, very strong association with increasing levels of plasmalogens in the brain, increasing levels of cognition, or vice versa. <clears throat> and we look at the known variables of associations with reduced cognitive functioning in the elderly. The APOE4 genotype is, is a big player, but APOE4 genotype is associated with higher levels of amyloid in the brain. So if you're an E4 carrier, you're more likely to have elevated amyloid in the brain than a non-E4 carrier. And amyloid is somewhat associated with tangles, but if you know the tangle density in the brain, then the amyloid is no longer statistically significant in terms of its association with cognition. And this is why this whole amyloid hypothesis in Alzheimer's has always been uh, a fallacy. We've known this for 30 some years now. But if we look at the association with cognition, the DHA plasmalogens, tangles, CHT stands for the choline high affinity transporter. It's a selective biomarker of cholinergic neurons. And flotillin, which is a marker of lipid rafts of where the beta secretase exists. So membrane structure. So you're dealing with um, that's what it comes down to. And we, when you do this multivariable analysis and say, what's left after all of this, you get these four variables after adjusting for age, sex, and education, genotype, and so on. The plasmalogens, for every standard deviation increase in plasmalogens, there's a five-fold reduction in um, probability of dementia. Tangles is a two-fold. And so you can just see the relative scale of these, these effects. <clears throat> and so brain plasmalogens and cognition, and this is, I'm not the only one who's shown this. There's many, many studies that have shown this, that um, the levels of plasmalogens in the brain are highly associated with cognitive performance. So it's a membrane lipid, flotillin is a membrane molecule, choline high affinity transporter is a biomarker of presynaptic acetylcholine vesicle density. And I'm gonna get to that in a few minutes. And tangles are actually also a biomarker of cholinergic neuron integrity and methyltransferase reserve capacity. So methyltransferase, I'm going to mention that, is another core physiological component of inflammation that's specifically in, in membrane maintenance. Which leads to plasmalogen precursors. And so I presented this back in 2007. This is a, when I first discovered this association between plasmalogen levels in the blood and cognitive performance, I went through and I did a very thorough um, international co collaboration with people in Japan, Case Western, Sun City, and so on. Um, 
to look at this in many, many aspects of it. So I won't go through it all in detail. But bottom line is that a peripheral metabolic deficiency at all stages of dementia of the Alzheimer's type, and it precedes the clinical manifestation, which you know led to this bigger concept of plasmalogen deficiency mediated diseases of aging. So the, the Alzheimer's and the cognitive impairment is somewhat of a canary in the coal mine that says, hey, uh, what, what are one of these weak signals as we get older? And it's the cholinergic neuron. I'm going to show you the weakness of that cholinergic neuron. And it's also the neuromuscular junction. So that's why sarcopenia and plasmalogens go side by side. And so the question becomes, how do we replace these plasmalogens? And it's not like we've, they're not brand new. We first discovered plasmalogens in the 1920s. We know there's rare diseases in children that have genetic mutations that prevent them from making plasmalogens. And these children rarely live to age 10. So high degrees of mortality early in life. So the obligate nature of plasmalogens is important, but restoring them turns out to be a bit of a pain. It's hard to get them restored. And so I never got myself involved in this until in the mid 2000s when we saw this association. And through trial and error, this concept of an alkyl acyl glycerol was really the missing link between the ability to intervene into the biochemical system of plasmalogens. Kind of the way L-DOPA restores dopamine in Parkinson's. We don't give Parkinson's patients dopamine because it doesn't get to where it's supposed to go, but we want a precursor that can get into the cell system. And that precursor turns out to be this alkyl acyl glycerol. And it can restore plasmalogens in NREL. These are pro, uh, RCDP mutated cell line that can't make plasmalogens. So it restores them. And so there's two types of plasmalogens. One is for function. It deals with the neuromuscular junction and the synapse. And I'm going to show you that. The second one, which is actually probably more important to core human physiology and which is important to early infant development, is the omega-9, oleic acid version, highly involved in your myelin, your Schwann cells. Um, and that's one of the key aspects of myelination. And that's what happens later on life. We start losing brain matter. Mostly we lose it white matter first. And so we did a clinical trial. It's been all, this is all published in this uh, post-mortem. Um, the, the, that's all published as well um, this last year. But we looked at this plasmalogen precursor in uh, Santa Monica using a clinical trial with Dr. Jordan's team there. And basically we did the following. We took baseline. We gave them one mil per day, which is 900 milligrams of plasmalogen precursor for the first month. Then we did two months at 1800 milligrams or two mils per day, and then a month at four mils per day. Okay, then we had a washout period. And we want to look at the oxidative stress biomarkers. We want to measure cognition performance as well as mobility. So these are people that had, a, these were individuals that already had mild, they had cognitive impairment. And what we found was that, as predicted, because we've done extensive animal work in these, these systems, is that we got a dose-dependent increase. So from baseline to month one, at the lower dose, the moderate dose increased and at the high dose. And then after a month of washout, it came back down again. So we got this dose-dependent increase. So we can, we can target specific plasmalogen subtypes, which is, this, in this case, it's the omega-3 DHA. And that can... Um, and it's even more pronounced if you if you baseline normalize it, everybody. And what we found was actually quite interesting, is that the individuals that had the highest level of cognitive impairment, so this is CDR level of two, so this is moderate dementia, there's no ambiguity with a CDR of two, CDR of one, and then we had a whole bunch of people with MCI or, or moderate levels. But within a four month period, 75% of people that had clear, frank cognitive impairment improved by an entire score. And their mobility improved. So the sit-stand rate for the sarcopenia measure, okay, was quite significantly improved from, from these individuals. And so we saw pretty significant mobility and cognition. And this wasn't even the purpose of the trial. We were just doing dose, dose finding. And we'd looked at biochemical markers of, of catalase and malnaldehyde and so on. And so this was pretty shocking. And we'll be doing follow-up on, on MRI type work going forward. 
So it's clearly working. And we now have lots and lots of people on it, my own, my, my own family. And it, it, it really does work. Um, people are getting better. It's crazy. Um, because we're, we're so we're so used to being told nothing works. And so if we take a look at this, the cognition was statistically significant, even in a 22 patient population. And the sit-stand was quite significant improvement in sit-stand rates across um, using a chi-square test. Now, plasmalogens have this vinyl ether bond in them, and that's what makes them so unique, but it also makes their dietary consumption virtually non-existent. This vinyl ether bond is designed like a fuse. It's designed to be to be initially attacked prior to, um, and it protects other nutrients of your of your cells in your body. And so what happens now, what we found was if we took the people melon dihaldi levels, first of all, they all decreased over time with the drug treat with the treatment. But what's more important is that people that had pre-existing malandahyde levels completely normalized them. A very strong correlation with decreased oxidative stress markers, which is what plasmalogens do. So we reduced oxidized stress. And catalase increased. So we're able to, those individuals that had baseline catalase levels that were very, very low, okay, were completely normalized um, within a few months. And so catalase is one of those enzymes that are used for breaking, for neutralizing hydrogen peroxide. And it's a degradative enzyme. So it has a protein. So if it's overused, it becomes degraded. Superoxide dismutase is an interesting molecule because it's both degradable, but it's also inducible. So both low levels and high levels can be considered uh, adverse. Um, and again, we, it was less of an effect than superoxide dismutase, but it still was there. So C-reactive protein, and I have only my own personal experience on, on C-reactive protein being reduced after taking the omega-3 plasmalogens. Of the 22 participants, four of them had baseline CRPs over one. All four were actually had low baseline plasmalogens at the start of the trial. All four of them CRP decreased by at least half a unit. Um, and in half of them, it, it, it was less than 0.5 by the end of the trial. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. So we this glycerol is effective at elevating the plasmalogens and it's doing something, right? It's it's reducing the oxidative stress load. Clearly, we can't, you know, we can't guess with malandialide and catalase levels, but we're also seeing this, this cognitive performance. So the question becomes: why? How? does this stuff work and why would it work? Why would you even assume it would work? And this is where trying to get into the biochemical mechanisms of cognition and neuropathology come in. Um, and the bottom line is that it's the reduced function is a cause of neuropathology. It's not, neuropathology is not causing a reduced reduction in function. It's the other way around. We have a lot of this stuff backwards. And this is where I get into the obvious versus not obvious and the assumptions versus truth. Because if you think of the obvious, the obvious thing is that the earth is flat. Like anyone gets up in the morning, you can see the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Like you gotta be a complete idiot to tell me that the earth is round. The earth is clearly flat. I can put a, I can put a ruler out there. And, for the, and statistically speaking, the earth is flat. It's only under really, really great distances that it turns into having a curvature. This is the obvious answer. This, you know, if you haven't been taught this in school, this is crazy. Really? We're circling around the sun and we're spinning on an axis and our moon is like, this is, but it's, it's not an obvious answer. It's only true because we studied it significantly enough. And science has shown us that we have to believe the, the, the actual reality and not what it appears to be. The same thing is happening here. Okay, the observations in Alzheimer's and aging are clear. Okay, the brain shrinks. Okay, that's not up for question. Okay, we get these we get these neurofibrillary tangles on the inside of the neurons, and we get these amyloid plaques forming between neurons. Okay, these aren't fake. These are real things that happen in the brain. And the question is is why and when and how. Okay, and are are these clear, unambiguous pathologies 
are they actually causing the functional deficits that we see in aging? Or is this an association that we're just taking for granted? So the obvious thing is if you have this healthy neuron, we get neurofibrillary tangles formed on the inside, we get amyloid plaques formed on the outside. And the assumption is that these neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques cause neurons to degenerate, that these are actually toxic entities and the toxicity of these entities cause neurons to die. And then once neurons die, we lose the function that they were performing. But this is actually not true. We go back to Brack's papers back in 1991. He, had, he showed no evidence of amyloid neurotoxicity in humans. The plaque-like deposits show considerable variable variations in shape and size. Most of them remain devoid of pathologically changed agrophilic nerve cells, cell processes, show neither distortions of the neurophil nor accumulation of glial cells. The nerve cells situated within the deposits appear virtually unchanged. And see also this, amyloid deposits therefore should not be confused with neuritic plaques. So he's saying here in pathologically examines, and this is, they did 2,600 brain autopsy, Barack and Brack, not a small amount of work. And then he goes on to say, and he's looking at the progression of neuropathology, and this is where the Brack scale comes in. It says no evidence of causality between amyloids and neurofibrillary tangles. Okay, depositions of amyloid are among the first changes seen in the brain. Most of them do not correspond to neuritic plaques, neuritic plaque, size and shape, blah, blah, blah. The fact that accumulations of amyloid are frequently found in the cortex of non demented individuals in the absence of neurofibrillary tangles changes. I mean, this all these case numbers has led to the assumption that depositions of amyloid precede the development of neurofibrillary changes. It is therefore important to note that in quite a number of cases, one can also recognize a contrasting pattern with cortical neurofibrillary changes preceding the deposition of amyloid. So the amyloid deposits cannot be considered. This is 1991. This is 31 years ago. And, and then if you go on now, if you take a look, when people tried 2002, 20 years ago, they tried to actually say how many of these neurons that we lose in the hippocampus are due to neurofibrillary tangles. And so they counted them all and was able to find that the neurofibrillary tangles accounted for only a small proportion of loss, 8.1%. So most of the neurons that were dying were not dying because of neurofibrillary tangle formation. And this is the information we have. And so then they, they do animal models, right? And here's an animal model where they create an, an animal model where the, the neurons accumulate excessive levels of neurofibrillary tangles. As, and they were doing this to prove the toxicity of neurofibrillary tangles. And what they found was the opposite. They found that, sorry, this thing is kind of, that, um, Unexpectedly, neurofibrillary tangle bearing neurons in the visual cortex appeared to be completely functionally intact, to be capable of integrating dendritic inputs, effectively encoding orientation and direction selectivity, and to have stable baseline resting calcium levels. And when they when the brain, when we look at the longitudinal studies or long, the cross-sectional studies of aging. The formation of amyloid and the formation of tangles in the human brain occur in two different locations. They don't actually even occur in the same place early on. Later on, they're everywhere. But if you take a look, the earliest formations of tangles occur in the hippocampal CA1 region, and the earliest formation of amyloid is in the neocortex. So the question becomes what's going on here? So you'll see that you have the way neurons connect with each other, where an axon connects to a cell body, you have the neurofibrillary tangles on the inside, plaques on the outside. And this all stands way back from 1978, when we're looking at the associations of plaque counts in the brain, okay? Brains with higher levels of plaques, showed that they had decreasing levels of choline acetyltransferase, which is a biomarker of, of presynaptic acetylcholine terminals. 
and acetylcholine esterase, which is a biomarker of the synaptic cleft. But the glutamate markers, or the, the postsynaptic receptors, were unchanged. And then this butyryl was compositorially increased. So this is 19, this, this really would stem the whole cholinergic hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. But if you look independent, it's still in the same paper, just mental test scores correlated with choline acetyltransferase activity, you get an equally strong association. And so colon, the cholinergic function is clearly associated with cognition. And that's true. And that's why the first drug ever invented um, on this was the denazepil Aricept um, worked. It doesn't work forever, but it does clearly work short term. So Drachman did an amazing study in the 70s. I had my pleasure of meeting him a few years ago before he died. And he said, because he never really do the study again. So what he did is he took these university students, healthy volunteers, and he gave them scopolamine, which is a muscarinic antagonist. So he blocked the activity of acetylcholine on the postsynaptic neuron. And by doing that, he was able to create short-term memory loss in these 20-year-olds, okay, just by blocking acetylcholine function. And then what he did is he took the same group, he gave them the scopolamine, then he also treated them with physosigmine, which is a acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, like Aricept, and he was able to attenuate the memory loss. Really good old-fashioned science here, cause and effect. Um, and I love this paper. Hardly anyone ever references it, but so the point here is that the blockage of acetylcholine at the postsynaptic neuron creates dementia. Well, if you take a look at scopolamine, okay, and there's other studies where they study other things, but here, if you just treat an animal with scopolamine, amyloid beta levels increase. And you know what else increases with scopolamine? Phosphorylated tau. And if you restore the postsynaptic acetylcholine function, the tau levels come back to normal. Amyloid levels come back to normal. So clearly, the cholinergic function of the neuron is associated with the tangle and amyloid formations. And if you take a look at scopolamine, cholesterol levels increase and phospholipids decrease. And so, of course, plasmalogens are one of these phospholipids. Okay, they're in this phospholipid category of decreasing. So this is where things get continually more interesting. So the biochemistry of cholinergic neuron dysfunction, again, truth versus fiction. This is how your brain cells work. But this is also how the neuromuscular junction works. Of, in, we release these acetylcholine neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. They act on the postsynaptic neuron and propagate a signal. And Wordman did a huge number of studies. Um, and then he kind of burnt out because he couldn't figure out what was going on. If you supply enough phosphocholine, these, these are, these are um, striatal slices. And you can, this is the amount of acetylcholine being released by the neuroterminal. As, and this is the number of, uh, of electron, of uh, uh, action potentials. And it'll continue to basically forever almost pump out acetylcholine. But if you block the choline uptake inhibitor, uptake proton called with hemochromium 3, it breaks, it blocks the choline hype and the transporter. So if you mentioned back early with, with the post-mortem studies, I showed you that the choline hype and the transporter, low levels of it associated with increased dementia. So if you block it with a drug, you reduce the acetylcholine release. And if you do that long enough, without feeding the brain choline, the phospholipids start decreasing. It's called autocannibalism is what he called it. Okay, so the brain starts eating itself, essentially. It, if you can't get enough choline to keep going, it will eat itself, it'll eat its, it'll eat its membrane to maintain its choline levels. And this eating of the membranes happens with phosphylcholines and phosphylethanolamines. And all these studies back here, they didn't really, they just kind of grouped the plasmalogens in with the, with the other phospholipids. And so what he showed very clearly, and he published his paper in Science back then, um, the reduced, if you block the uptake of choline, you cause neurons to shrink and die. And this is what the next part comes in, is the methyl transfer system and homocysteine. So it turns out 
when you're making phosphatidylcholine, not just in the periphery, but in your brain, one of the main mechanisms of making it is called N-phosphatidylethanolamine N-methyltransferase. And the synaptosomes have one of the highest activities. So this methyltransferase activity is very, very active in the brain, especially in your synapses. And so Kennedy did a wonderful paper where he took the post-mortem studies of brains and he looked at um, SAH, so um, S adenosyl homocysteine. So you guys follow homocysteine for inflammation, autism, if you're studying autism, this stuff, the methyltransferase system comes up all the time. But the brains of Alzheimer's patients had high levels of SAH and the SAH caused an inhibition of methyltransferase. Okay, I think this is catechol or methyltransferase. I can't see my slide very well here. And in fact, if you took the extracts of brains of an Alzheimer's patient and ex vivo looked at whether or not they could inhibit catechol or methyltransferase activity, they did, and PEMT. So the actual brain extracts of an Alzheimer's patient is such that it is inhibitory to um, methyltransferase activity, COMP, uh, catechol or methyltransferase, and the phosphatidyl ethanolamine and methyltransferase. Well, that's what's going on right here. So this is where SAH is being created. It's being created at the synapse terminals here. What happens with phosphorylated tau? And what's the relationship between the formation of phosphorylated tau and SAH and SAM? Well, as SAH levels go up, you get a dose-dependent increase in phosphorylated tau in exactly the same location of the human brain where we see these things, which leads us to the homocysteine system, right? So we measure homocysteine as a very powerful biomarker of, of dementia risk for other and also other um, um, risk factors. But homocysteine is really a biomarker of SAH levels. And based upon the percentage of homocysteine, okay, as you get older, the number of people that have high homocysteine levels, okay, when we're in the early 60s, about 25% of the population, but as we get older, the number of people that have high levels of homocysteine goes up dramatically. Less so now, because our, our B vitamin usage is getting better and better at this in the general population. But the cumulative incidence of dementia in subjects with high homocysteine is a highly, highly reproducible observation. So homocysteine is strongly associated with cognitive impairment. And this is where 20 years later, Ferguson Brickley kind of cracked the code that Wertman was working on way back in the late 70s and early 80s. And what he found, they found, was that this choline high affinity transporter wasn't actually on the postsynaptic or the presynaptic membrane. It was actually on the vesicles. So unlike a dopamine transporter or a serotonin transporter that stick around all the time sitting here, the cholinergic neuron, the transporter that's, that brings the choline back up isn't actually on the membrane. It's on the presynaptic vesicles, which means they don't get expressed only during the fusion and the synaptic release of neurotransmitters during this process. So this membrane fusion process is which gives us all of our neurological function. And not just in the brain, the neuromuscular function, our heart, synaptic, act, our sinus rhythms of our heart are all based upon this basic physiological structure, composition, of, construct of membrane fusion. Turns out membrane fusion is entirely dependent on plasmalgin levels in the membrane. So if we want to look at 100% plasmalogens of the ethanolamine pool versus 25%, okay, 175, 50, 25. So as the plasmalogen level in the membrane goes down, the ability for membranes to fuse and release the neurotransmitters goes down with it. Which is why this association is so strong that we see in human postmortem brain samples. Okay, this association here is, is basically measuring the level of plasmalogens in those synapses. And of course, Scientists have been studying this for a while now. They've looked at what happens if you if you if you have an animal model that is plasmalgen deficient from birth. Well, an ether lipid animal has equally decreased abilities of acetylcholine and glutamate release. 
Okay, so if animals are born and grow with, with low levels of plasmalogens in their brain, they have impaired neurotransmitter release, both the endogenous and the radio labeled versions. And their brains shrink. Okay, the, 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 the white matter, okay, levels are dramatically reduced. And this is what we see in inborn errors of metabolism of plasmalogen deficiency. This is also what we see in premature birth. And it's also mildly seen in the difference between um, breastfed and formula fed babies. And so white matter, this is myelin basic protein levels dramatically decreased in animals that can't make plasmalogens and their brain weights are way down. And their myelination the, 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 the speed, the conduction speed of their neurons and their myelinated neurons are dramatically reduced. And of course, that's virtually everything. That's our, that's our um, Schwann cell uh, nerve conductivity as well as our, as our oligodendrocyte brain cells. So this is what plasmalogens look like in the, in the adult population now. This is where the 18-1 version, this is oleic acid, this is the one that's in our myelin, the DHA version, that's the one that's in our synapses. And you can see we peak in our 50s, typically. And then we see this systematic decline. And this has been reported since the 60s. This is not a brand new finding. We just did, this is a bigger study with about a thousand people that we published on. And this is brain volume decline with aging. This is how the human brain declines with age. It's a pretty scary number. You can see we, we basically stay fairly stable to our mid 50s and our brain starts shrinking. And if we look at plasmalogen restoration, if we take plasmalogen and restore them, we take cholesterol, we dose cells with cholesterol, cholesterol will increase amyloid formation. Can't go in great detail, but plasmalogens, we get a dose-dependent decrease in amyloid formation in cell culture. And we get this dose-dependent increase in alpha secretase levels. What we see in the laboratory is what we see in human brains. This is human post-mortem brain samples looking at the um, levels of amyloid in the brain of individuals with high levels of plasmalogens versus individuals with low levels of plasmalogens. And plasmalogens actually will counteract and they neutralize the APOE4 genotype. I won't get too detailed here that the, a the APP alpha, soluble APP alpha, like obviously people are excited about amyloid for years, but we cannot actually create an animal model where amyloid precursor protein is mutated because they all die in utero. And the reason for it is this soluble APP alpha is a very, very potent neurogenic factor. And people are now considering it as a, as a, as a treatment, neurogenic treatment in and of itself. So the final thing I want to talk about is this brain shrinkage. Does Alzheimer's actually cause brain shrinkage? Or is it the other way around? And I found this study very, very interesting. So they did this is they did um, pathological diagnosis. There's two tables here: pathological diagnosis in 626 pages with clinical diagnosis of AD. So all 626 of these people had cognitive impairment. And then they, in a blinded way, the pathologist looked at the brains and said, "How many of these clinically demented individuals do we have pathology?" And you'll see that the brain weights are pretty consistent across all of these. The only thing different is the that had a pathological diagnosis of normal was slightly higher, but not, nothing significant. But they're all right around 1,000, you know, a kilo. Well, what happens when you do the study the opposite way? What if happens if you do a clinical diagnosis of 227 patients with a pathological diagnosis of pure AD. Well, now you see the correlation with brain size. So here, remember, all of these have a pathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But if you have a pathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's and you're cognitively normal, your brain is still of a normal weight. So the biochemistry of impaired cholinergic neurons the impaired cholinergic function results in the following. Reduced phospholipids. Okay, we get shrinkage, increased total cholesterol, phospholipid membrane ratios. Reduced alpha secretase, increased amyloid precursor protein, 
and so on. Increased phosphorylated tau, reduced mitochondrial function, increased oxidative stress. So maintaining acetylcholine neuron transmission, the Crex at least. So it's, it's a functional, we lose function. And as a result of that loss of function, a lot of these other bad things happen. So maintaining acetylcholine function is really what it's all about. Cognition is correlated with and dependent upon sustainable presynaptic acetylcholine neurotransmitter release, period. It's over and over and over again, shown that. The reduced synaptic choline uptake via the choline high affinity transporter, that's the Achilles heel of the cholinergic neuron. And it's the root cause of cholinergic neuroregeneration in Alzheimer's and in aging. And it's the root cause of sarcopenia. The choline high affinity transporter is localized on presynaptic acetylcholine vesicles and is only expressed on the presynaptic membrane following depolarization and fusion. So anything that, anything that inhibits membrane fusion and neurotransmitter release will inhibit this uptake and will cause uh, a degeneration cascade. So membrane plasmalogens are depleted in Alzheimer's and in aging. So when we look at this as a brain health perspective, okay, obviously these plasmalogens, um, we can try to get more of them through resistance training, intermittent fasting, those things help. Obviously reducing toxic load in our bodies will help, but it's pretty hard to get enough. So plasmalogen supplementation is, is gonna become more and more normal. It's kind of like breastfeeding for adults. Okay, it's pretty well what it is. We're saying um, these critical nutrients, we don't stop needing them later on in life. Another thing that I notice a lot in our practice and patient, our doctors is phosphocholine levels get decreased. It's hard to keep up on those. So lethicin is important. The methyltransferase reserve, a lot of this issue with creatinine or creatine for muscle wasting is involved in methyltransferase. I didn't get into that detail, but Creatine and choline are the two main drivers of homocysteine levels. You want to make sure you got B12, B6, methylfolate, mitochondrial capacity, and so on. But that's kind of in a very rapid fire process, kind of a, uh, the real short story of the, of the, of the of plasmalogens and, and um, so on. So, okay, I will, we can top, we can, Fire away. Oh, so the mild cognitive impairment. Yeah, so I've had dramatic, my aunt, for example, she got so bad in long-term care and it's hard when people get into long-term care because they, they lock them up and you can't get into them and help them. But she was at the point she couldn't recognize my cousins any longer. I have her on four, four mils of neuro. She can now recite everybody in her 50th wedding anniversary album. Okay, these are real events um, that are occurring in people's lives. Um, and so mild cognitive impairment, brain fog. Um, COVID is interesting. Um, COVID specifically reduces the omega-9 plasmalogens in the lung. Okay, this is documented and published that it affects lung function. And we've had several people pull people out of ICU units on uh, lung function by giving them the, the, the glia, the omega-9. And anecdotally, like from our doctors out there, the brain fog and energy the neuro seems to help for sleep and for the inflammatory component, the glia seems to be more important. Glia is really the concussion, stroke, you know, TBI, autism type molecule, and neuro is more for performance. How long do we see plasmalogen? It depends on the dose. Um, typically within a few weeks, you start seeing things. And you start seeing, usually people see better eye contact the more engaging with each other. Um, and then it kind of slowly builds up from there. Um, when do you use glia or neuro? I've, I've changing as time goes on. Typically neuro, in, personally, I take neuro in the morning. It gets me through my morning fast and everything else. Like, so I take a couple gram, a couple of mils of that in the morning and then I take glia about an hour before bedtime. And so I use glia at night for white matter restoration. And I use neuro during the day for performance enhancement. Um, it just wakes you up. It, 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 it's kind of, it's weird. Neuro kind of makes your brain do this. It feels like you open up, okay? Um, and glia feels like you put glasses on your brain. It kind of makes you feel like this. And so it depends. Like people with autism or ADHD during the day, um, neuro can make them more hyper. So you want to be a little bit careful of that. 
where glia really puts them on focus. Glia, I've got some pretty interesting results with glia in bipolar disorder, by the way, as well. What happens with the vestibular nerve or neuritis? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, typically anything that's inflammatory, I like to focus on restoring and rebuilding first. The best way to think of glia and neural is like tuning a radio station. Okay, when the radio station is out of tune, it's staticky, right? And that's and that's because the, the impulse, the axonal impulse is being scattered. It's not being clean and clear going through the, you know, your nerve transmission is scattered and it's losing it. And so if the volume is low, you can still kind of get signal. But if you crank the volume up, all you hear is static. So glia is about making that neurological signal clean. Neuro is about turning the volume up. So typically when you have an inflammatory or neuropathic pain, or you have some sort of uh, neural inflammation, you want to work with glia, you want to work with mitochondrial support like n acetylcysteine carnitine, phosphocholine. You want to get that, make sure they get their cholesterol levels up, get them, you know, try to get their cholesterols in the mid 200s, try to get that membrane structure back. And then after that, you can turn the volume up. Um, dosing, uh, you know, I've been conservative and we've changed that more and more. I like to step people up. Um, if you're just looking for your own longevity and health promotion, a couple of mils a day is fine. Like, you know, the gel caps before gel caps is kind of what for people over 50, for example. Um, if you're, if you're trying to turn back the clock, if you're trying to rebuild membranes and rebuild the brain, then you have to get up to more of a four mil per day dose. So in the clinical trial, you can see the two mil dose got it up there for a while, but we really started seeing effects in cognitive impaired persons when you get to the higher dosage. So it is, you kind of find it yourself. You can kind of, you can go to a loading dose and then bring it back down again. And that's what I've learned over the last little while is that, you know what, let's get this dose up. Let's get people seeing an effect, and then bring it back down again. And if they can, and then they, I find that the patients are more powerfully motivated by, oh, I had function, now it's kind of going away. Otherwise, it's this delayed gratification. Sometimes if you take too long to get an effect, um, but that's, the, I think people have their own, um, you know, each person is, is, is gonna be different. Uh, neuroanglia, they're called prodrome neuro. It's 100% uh, omega-9, omega-3. It's uh, We get the DHA from an LJ source, and then we attach the, the omega-3 DHA onto a plasmalogen backbone. And it's, you can take it in the fasting state. The nice thing about these precursors is that they, they piggyback on your triglyceride pathways of the body. And this is what feeds your brain. When you first eat a meal, the very first thing when you eat a meal is that your triglycerides go through your VLDL system. And, and your VLDL system is designed to feed your brain and your muscles first before anything else in your body. And so that's the first source of food energy that you get after a meal. And the plasmalogens back, the, the alkyl glycerols um, piggyback on that system, which is basically what breastfeeding is. Basically, it's what it, it, how, it, how it piggybacks on there. Caps better than liquid or the other way around. It's perfect choice. I guarantee you, you will hate the neuro taste. It's, it's, it's nasty stuff. So the, the gel caps are what people want for the neuro, the omega-3 version. I still take the liquid version because I've gotten used to it over the years. But, um, and glia, it doesn't really matter. That's whatever is convenient for you. Um, the glia has no problems for taste. Like for, for children that are on feeding tubes and so on and so forth, obviously we have a liquid formulation, but the glia, you can just drip it into your food. It's, um, it sounds silly, but that's pretty well as simple as that. You mentioned, is there any evidence that fasting can increase plasmalogen levels? Yeah, so the, your fasting state is where anything that improves peroxisomal function, okay? So anything that you would normally do to lower triglycerides, for example, in a high triglyceride person. So if they get intermittent fasting, a ketogenic diet, uh, resistance training, all of that will improve peroxisomal function. And when you improve peroxisomal function, you will improve plasmalogen levels, okay? So um, that's the simplest way. And then, um, 
you know, resistance training and intermittent fasting is probably the best natural source of doing it. Our plasmalogen source from shellfish, no. This is all vegan based. And it's also not just because I'm like, I'm not really, you know, some people are vegan, but it's mostly for cleanliness and clarity. Like we take a triglyceride source, like, and we use an LJ source for triglycerides and then we saponify it. So, and we digest it off to get the free fatty acids. And then we purify those free fatty acids. And then we take those pure free fatty acids and we put them on a, a plasmalogen backbone. So this is a pure chemical synthesis using natural sources so that the product at the end is completely free of any trace metals. It's a, the purification is very, very good. And so that way it's, it's, it's not from shell. And that's also, it's important that we get the structural specificity right. It's when you take a DHA plasmalogen, you want the DHA plasmalogen to go into your synapses. Okay, and that's why you get the immediate impact. Over 12 to 24 hours, it, it, they, they kind of spread out. But for that, for that short, for the first phase, you want that precursor right. And omega-9, the glia has a 100% omega-9 and that, that fatty acid comes from a sunflower oil source. Um, so the source of the fatty acid is just convenience and, and cleanliness but um, we, it's fully processed and purified in our, our system. So when you wanna focus on the white matter, um, you go with the glia. Yeah, so fenofibrate, yeah, probably, um, I don't have direct evidence, but I would, I would predict that fibrates will increase plasmalogen levels. They do in cell culture and other studies um, for sure. And um, so, Um, cancer is a very interesting story. So it's a, and it's a, it's a more complicated one, but plasmalogens are deficient in virtually all cancers. Okay. Colon, pancreatic, breast, lung, ovarian. Like I've studied almost virtually every cancer and they, there's a pre-existing low level of plasmalogens. And that's linked to this impaired fasting state in all cancers. But in taking plasmalogens, like the old alkyl glycerols, one of the their, their really good usages were in the 70s, even from shark liver oil, for example, was reduction of toxicity from radiation therapies. So they do reduce tumor load. Um, I would be cautious in a metastatic patient. So for cancer prevention and for early cancer treatment, metastatic cancer, I think you'd want to be a little more careful because when you have an actively growing cell system, okay, you're, they, they consume plasmalogens. And there's not a huge amount of data on this. The data that is out there indicates that plasmalogen supplementation, the alkyl glycerols, shrink tumor volumes and tumor growth rates. But those are small studies. So I think patients should keep an eye on it. Um, they close. Whether statins inhibit plasmalogens. Actually, probably the other way around. The pleiotropic effect of statins. So statins are a funny thing. It's stands are a little bit of poison, and then your body's reaction to the poison gives you a bit of a benefit. Okay, so what statins do, they're basically a mitochondrial toxin, if you will. They, they block HMG CoA, and so they they block your cells' ability to make cholesterol. And the compensation mechanism for that um, can have increased plasmalogen levels. So you get this lowering of LDL, but sometimes you get this increase in HDL. And the increase in HDL is due to improved peroxidome function sometimes. So I'm not a big statin fan. I think they're mostly a waste of time, but um, they do have some of that. Um, your body will react to it and your reaction to the statins creates a positive outcome. Oh, there was another one, the, the ahi flower oil. I don't know much about that. Whoever asked that question, can you tell me a bit what ahi flower is, oil? Okay, we'll get back to that. If you if you ask, fine. Um, so Dr. Then, Fishbein. Sorry? It was Dr. Fishbein asked that, so I don't know. He's backing on the, the ahi yeah. flower oil. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. High dose vitamin B1. The B vitamins, I think, is an interesting, like B1, of course. Yeah, we forget about B1, B2, and B3s. Like, like niacin is something we should be on quite a bit. And Supplemental doses of, plus, of, of B vitamins are important because there's a pharmacokinetic pulse. It's, it's, not, it's not 
clinically equivalent. Like if I take, if I spread out a B vitamin dosage during my meal and it gets a slow spread, it's not the same as getting a pulse that gets into your cells. So yes, so thiamine, um, B2 for people that are trying to get their, their, their trace metals up, like for zinc and copper and iron absorption. B, uh, riboflavin deficiencies are another, like some of these B vitamin deficiencies are extremely underreported. Uh, uh, so I'm a big believer in relatively high dose B vitamins with little holidays. You can take them for a day or two, take them off a day or two. But get, I'd rather people take a slightly higher dose for a shorter period of time and then take a holiday than just take a low dose chronically because you, you kind of want to get these things into these cells. Your cells of your body act like a little trapping mechanism, right? So if you, if you peak them, they'll drive them into your cells and your cells will hold them, okay? And then they'll dissipate out afterwards. But sometimes if you just get low levels, just your main cells get, get the vitamins, not all your cells get your vitamins. Can you OD on plasmalogens? I haven't found any way. It just turns into food energy. It turns into very, very expensive olive oil, basically, and very, very expensive fish oil at some point in time. But yeah, you can OD in anything, I think. Um, but technically speaking, no. It just turns into, your body will just consume it as a caloric source at a certain point in time. It's, it's, it's basically food. Oh, offy, offy flour is dry from... Corn grama plant, flowering plant that in English says mainly found you know, be rich in essential omega 3 alpha linolenic acid. Okay. And steridonic acid. Yeah, so alpha linolenic, um, so the omega 3, like ahi oil or flax oil, um, is also, they're, they're powerful. Your body doesn't use very much of it. Like, this is an interest, like when you talk about your omega 3s, people talk about the alpha linolenic acid and EPA, for example, is another one. But really, all of these are just bit players. DHA is what your body wants. And if you look at your body, like, um, like alpha linolenic acid is a PPAR agonist, so it'll stimulate peroxidome function. So fatty acids themselves are bioactive molecules. They are, they're both nutritionally, they're, they're used actually as building blocks, but they're also signaling molecules. So when you take an alpha linolenic acid from flax or, from, or you take EPA, for example, those are PPAR agonists. And that's what gives them their triglyceride lowering activities. But your body doesn't use them. If I take your brain or take your muscles and I measure how much of your membranes contain alpha linolenic acid, it's almost undetectable. It's way less than a percent. And same thing with EPA. Like your body uses very, EPA is a metabolic byproduct of DHA. And so your body doesn't actually use it. And when you use it as a drug, what they're using it for is they're using it to replace arachidonic acid levels. And so. It's, um, you know, like, that's why all these, these um, food is medicine, right? These supplements, like they'll have, some of them will be biochemical intermediates, but they also have signaling powers. They, they'll actually, they, they, they'll do some things other than just, just nutritional aspect of it. So, are KS2 inhibitors like Ripatha? I apologize for my ignorance. What do those do? RSK. RKS2. I'm not, I'm not familiar with those. Apologize. Okay, Dr. Richwine, do you have a, that is RKS2 inhibitors like Ripatha? Well, that's, uh, you know, they use that for uh, cholesterol uh, lowering as a, an adjunct to statins. Yeah, see, the optimal cholesterol levels in humans are between 220 and 240 for longevity. Soon as cholesterol gets under 200, your all-cause mortality doubles. When it gets down to 150, you're at three to four times the average death rate of the average person. So longevity, you don't want to get your cholesterol under 200. Soon as cholesterol gets under 200, I like to see cholesterol over two, between 220 and 240, ideally. Uh, LDL should be over, say, 120 to 140, and you want to keep your HDL levels in that 60 to, you know, over 50 for sure, but definitely ideally 60, 80 range. But yeah, so, and this is not trivial. These, these are millions of patients, multiple countrywide studies looking at all-cause mortality. And it, the, as you get older, it's more and more important that you don't become cholesterol deficient, okay? Um, it, it, so for longevity, it's, it's really not, it's in contra, it's, the data is very, very robust on this thing. So yeah, so, Lowering cholesterol is something that 
the only value it has is if you have lots of oxidized, oxidized LDL. So statins have a clinical benefit in people that have a pre-existing high CRP level. Okay, and so what you're doing is by lowering overall cholesterol levels, you are also lowering the risk of having oxidized cholesterol, creating an atherosclerotic um, cascade. But if you have if you have low CRP, your cholesterol is pretty well benign. There's nothing toxic about it. What's your definition of a low CRP or a high CRP? Um, I like to keep CRP under one, um, ideally, but try to keep it under, when it gets over, it should be, it should be under one. And if you target it, you should be able to get it down there. But if you have inflammatory, like you guys are, you know, dealing with room to earth, people that have chronic inflammatory issues. Um, but the, the real danger comes when it gets up in that three to five and higher, if it's chronically above, you know, that level. But um, do you see any danger when it goes, say, from 0 0.8 to we, we do it in our practice regularly, at least every six or always first and at least every six months mm -hmm. when, it, when it climbs like from like 0 0.8 to 1.2. I mean, that's technically normal. It can happen. Like, I, here, I'll give you an example. Just I was doing some work. Um, so you have to be careful with how people are working out. Like wh how, when's the last time they've worked out before getting a CRP test done? Because exercising will increase your CRP levels and takes 48 hours from an exercise routine to, for your CRP to normalize. And based upon your, your basic oxidative stress situation. So for example, just about three weeks ago, I was, we were doing this little mini trial with people here. And so my CRP was 2.5. Okay. Cause I'd worked out and I wasn't paying attention. Right. I took, um, kind of a third of a bottle of neuro and the very next day it was 0.8 in 24 hours. So CRP can change, like it's a good general marker of inflammation, um, especially when it when you see CRP high and homocysteine high at the same time. Uh, I like to use CRP in context of other inflammatory markers to see, are we truly getting a, a generalized situation? Or yes, I, I always measure CRP. I think it's an important marker, but just recognize that it can be somewhat dynamic. Um, in terms of its levels. Um, so, yeah, so I wouldn't, unless, unless you see a reason for it, and if it, if it climbs and it's chronic and you can't, if you just can't knock it down with anything, um, then, you know, you just, I find it really useful to, to, as a endpoint to tell me, am I, am I finding the right buttons to push, right? Because theoretically, like, there's, it's, it should be, you should be able to drop it down. Our, yeah, RKS2 inhibitors are not statin drugs, different mechanisms. So yeah, I'm not sure how it works. Cholesterol transport, you want cholesterol, reverse cholesterol transport working properly. Your body, your cholesterol, your mem it's, it's not your cholesterol levels, it's cholesterol in your membranes. And it's like, it's like your temperature switch on your wall. Your membranes are designed to have a certain level and you need to be able to export it through the HDL system. And you need to be able to bring it in through the LDL and make it internally. And those two mechanisms regulate your cholesterol levels. And usually the biggest problem that we have with aging and disease is that the HDL system starts getting impaired. People become choline deficient. And when you're, you have low levels of phosphocholine, you can't, your, your cholesterol export mechanisms. Like if you want to get the foamy macrophages down, it's cholesterol export, which is why the phosphocholine IV therapies, like when, people, when, you, like, uh, when you give people IV phosphocholine, what that does is it it sucks cholesterol out of cells through the HDL system. It drive it drives that HDL reverse cholesterol transport system because HDL requires phosphocholine to work. So that's really kind of what you want to, you know, that's a bigger conversation. But anyways, that's kind of but yeah, plasma allergies are kind of one of these weird things that you you kind of can't unsee them. The numbers are just so damn big. Um, and, um, and they've been sitting there in plain sight for years. We're talking about 30% of your brain, like your, your heart, your lungs, like the second highest concentration of plasmalogen in the human body is a, is a human heart. It's just ridiculous. Like the levels of these things we have, like, we're not talking about micrograms. We're talking, these are pounds of this stuff in your body. It's just ridiculous that it's just not even on our radar. Um, you can go to, like, it's on Amazon and it's on protome.com. Um, you can get it there. And then 
we, uh, blood testing, we have blood testing, we do certification training, we do similar things like you're doing right now, but we do case study, study, you know, people, as people get involved in um, research. And my goal is to bring some of this research level testing and technology into everyday practice. So that's not such a, like, it's, there's such a gap between this type of research and the implementation. It's not a lack of knowledge. Like we actually know a lot. We're just really bad at implementing the knowledge that we have. And so it's it's kind of, uh, for me, it's personally just saying, you know what, let's roll our sleeves up here and start applying some of this knowledge. Um, and the barriers and the time windows to get these things into place is just, it's just ridiculous. Like cholesterol, like I just got, I, my friend, like my person with bipolar that we're taking care of, Sit blood test into lab corp comes back the dietitian just called me today well his cholesterol is 208 we should you know we it's, it's high i'm going you know and you have to be polite but that's just not true and so if we can't deal with these kind of simple systems um that's kind of what we're dealing with so you know we'll get there you know try to help one person at a time as best we can so so how 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 do I explain to my to our resident uh, lipidologist, Dr. Lillo, who's uh, you know all over um, the uh, cholesterol should be basically zero, and and there's no convincing them otherwise. Okay, well if you guys have ten seconds, I will pop up a presentation, a, a slide for you guys, and this is this is the slide to make people like that go away, um, like in a polite way. Uh, okay. Can you guys we share Can you guys all see that? Yes. Uh -huh. This is like one study. This is 2019. 12.8 million cohort subject. This is hazard ratio for total cholesterol, in men and women, okay, all cause mortality. And if you go by age, okay, so as cholesterol gets under 200 here, especially when it drops here, this is where your all cause mortality creeps up. And as you go from, if you're 40 to 55 years old, Here's your all-cause mortality risk of high cholesterol. Like, look at this. This is all flat from 200 to 260. Like total flat line here for all-cause mortality risk. It doesn't start going up until you get below 200. Okay, and this, and I have populations like there's, and as we get older, you'll notice that we're getting this population um, segregation. We're starting to, all these people with low cholesterol are starting to die. Okay, this is what you're seeing here. You're seeing this, this population preservation going on. And so these, these high cholesterol people keep on dying off. So by the time you get to 75 to 99, like you're down to this flat line, but it, it, you can see it's totally flat lined. Um, and I can go through all the, the, the statin. I go, this is actually on my website if you wanna go through the cholesterol presentation and you can hear me talk about it in different ways. But yeah, like how do you, how how do you treat someone when you have this kind of data? Like I, I don't I don't like how do you say well this is bad we we you know two hundred is bad we got to get you down here. Well that doesn't look like it's smart to me. And so so that's kind of and you can go through there's much much more there's this is only one of several several studies looking at this and. Um, but yeah, so you can kind of go through that kind of stuff and the HDL yeah. levels and so on. So that's kind of, so when you talk about statins and statin, even the statin therapy, if you look at cancer and mortality with statin versus non-statins. Um, so I explain that data. They do some trickery with statistics, um, but um, I got a presentation on cholesterol and there's another one on cancer, how, because cancer fundamentally is driven by cholesterol dynamics as a general rule. Um, cholesterol clearance capabilities. And, and that's why that cancer cell shifts to a mitochondrial system. So, 
anyways. Well, we're, okay. we're definitely so, going to so we're gonna 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 definitely ask you to come back for to 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 to, to give us a, more on that a, a little bit down the road. So as you can tell, I love this stuff. This is what I I, I live for. I, I, I have a I have I have a question here. So sure. cholesterol is being carried by low density lipoproteins, right? Yep. Okay, and most of the time they don't relate the death to the cholesterol per se. Cholesterol per se does not cause any um, harm to the blood vessels, um, but the oxidized form of LDL. Yeah, so the oxidized is, LDL is atherogenic, but this is the important part. See, people think right. we get this mindset of the molecule as a toxic protagonist. It's actually doing something. Okay, homocysteine is toxic. TMAO is toxic. That's not true. These are biomarkers. Okay, TMAO, okay, if I inject that into you, it actually prevents heart attacks. Okay, it's a measure of gut dysbiosis, okay, which is correlated with cardiovascular endpoints. But TMAO itself has no toxicity to the to heart. So, but cholesterol is an important part. Think about it because you have two main systems the LDL, we have three systems the LDL system that transports cholesterol. And it gets LDL gets absorbed into the cell through the LDL receptors and it gets digested in the lysosome. So you, your cells actually suck LDL in. That's how cells get cholesterol if they need it. Okay. And HDL is what the excess cholesterol in the cell, when it gets sent outward, it gets recirculated and it gets shared among the cell. That's why it's so important in the brain that your HDL system can share cholesterol. But your cells take up cholesterol only when they have to. Okay. So what statins do is they prevent the cell from making their own cholesterol and they force the cell to get cholesterol from the blood supply. And so what statins do is they upregulate the LDL receptor. So they force the cells to, because since the, they prevent the cell from making their own cholesterol, they force the cell to pull cholesterol from the circulating system and therefore you lower LDL levels. And so the, when you have good internal cholesterol metabolism, the cells don't need any cholesterol. They say, you know what, I'm fine. It's like it's like having a it's like having solar panels on your house. Okay. It's like you're actually donating energy back to the system. And that's where the that's why LDL system, and that's why low cholesterol becomes quite a negative health consequence because it indicates that the cellular health of the person is impaired. It indicates the cells of the body are having a hard time making enough cholesterol. There's something wrong internally in that cell because if it can't make its own cholesterol. It's, it's forcing it to get its cholesterol from the, the blood supply system, from the LDL system. And that's why, that's why that negative, that high mortality goes up um, with low cholesterol. But there's another version of the story is that it, the cholesterol LDL, even if it's high, is not the cause of damaging the, the blood vessels, but the oxidized yeah. form of LDL, where it become free radical generators, and they start um, eating the blood vessels by oxidizing them and that generate the plagues. So um, when we looked at uh, risk of cardiovascular diseases, we see the oxidized LDL as a factor, not the level of LDL, even if it's high, it's not necessary that it's going to cause um, high risk of having cardiovascular, but the oxidized LDL it is. Absolutely. And then oxidized LDL is um, a factor of other things, which is the oxidative stress of the of the patient. So, yeah. and generally, let's say if patients has high glucose and non controllable, then those of glucose will be oxidized and become glycans. And those glycans, oxidized glucose, can oxidize the LDL and become oxidized LDL. And so, here the problem here is really not. Uh, or the way to fix it is just lower the sugar uh, by and, and preventing those sugar from reacting with those free radicals out there. And the other way of doing it is also um, giving antioxidant and, and clear those, those free radicals because that's the factor that leads to oxidized LDL, right? Absolutely. That's all correct. And what happens with the oxidized LDL is it gets into the endothelial dysfunction. It gets, in, it gets into that endothelial bi layer of, of your arteries and then it can't get out. Okay, and then it right. supports, and it supports that foamy macrophage. Right, they are free radical generators. They, they, they yeah. just, uh, 
damage and eat and um, oxidize the blood vessels, protein components, um, and lead to the endothelial dysfunction. Uh, but the way you manage it is actually um, bu buffering the redox. In other words, giving antioxidants to neutralize um, those free radicals that leads to the oxidation of LDL or lowering the, the sugar because the sugar can be also high, high of it, can, can Absolutely. oxidize. Yeah. Like when sugar levels increase or your insulin, you become insulin insensitive, it means that your cells have a problem metabolizing sugar. So if your cells can't metabolize glucose and saying, hey, I'm full, you stop sending me more glucose. I can't, I can't metabolize the glucose you're already sending me. And so it's not pulling glucose into the cells because it can't. It's saying I'm I'm too I I can't process the glucose that you're already sending me. And then glucose levels increase, which then causes insulin to go up. You're saying, well, what's worse? I'm going to force this glucose into your cell because if if you don't take care of it, someone else has got to take care of it in my body. Okay, I'm going to get fatty liver or something else with it. And so yeah, so improving the and that's why intermittent fasting and exercise lowers try lowers cures type 2 diabetes because what you've done is you've increased the cellular capacity the glycolytic capacity of the cells and as soon as you get that cellular energy back and the cells can now process their normal levels of glucose all of a sudden glucose levels go down and your 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 need for insulin goes down and you're no longer insulin insensitive anymore all right and the other thing is that when you give them insulin really even the high sugar is not the real real cause of the oxidation, it's the insulin yeah. itself. And, and but when you give insulin to lower the sugar um, and you're giving it all, you know, more frequently because of the diabetic, I yeah. think it's more causing more even oxidative stress and more damaging to the blood vessels, the insulin itself. And because yeah, well, the yeah. insulin reduces free radicals, part of the mechanism, yeah. it interlines the sugar, but it generates a lot of free radicals that will oxidize the glucose. And so well, treatment of using insulin, right? It actually, with time, it makes um, blood vessels more worse because correct. of the, the the byproducts of the adding insulin. It just generate free radicals. Correct. And so the thing is, like, when people have high, too. when people have high glucose, is it is it because they're insulin deficient? Okay, like you're not giving someone, you're not giving an insulin deficient person insulin to lower the glucose. They have, they have normal insulin, but that insulin, they're called insulin insensitive because the normal level of insulin isn't driving that glucose into the cells of the body. And the question really becomes is why, right? And so what you're doing uh, is- Because you're... of the oxidative, when- Correct. So this is in the vicious circle, the, oxi the free Correct. radicals and all that makes uh, the internalization system uh, uh, not working because Correct. it will oxidize those receptors and the insulin become insensitive and sensitive and they cannot get the sugar in. Exactly. And so that's what which, which I'm talking about, which means it's it's really wrong for people who say, oh, I'm going to eat chocolate and sugar and they take insulin. <laughs> <laughs> and so that insulin I, I know I have, I have family friends do that too. So, oh, this is great. I can just, I just give myself a little extra insulin after my meal. And you're going, wow, man, yeah. But yeah, so... I think the biggest thing we forget to do is ask the question, why, right? And, you know, why is my glucose high? Like what's causing this? And, and so sometimes we just kind of blindly, you know, force it. So, yeah, so I'm, I, I agree with you on that one. And then that's why, that's why the lifestyle interventions for type 2 diabetes have much better outcomes than, than insulin, of course. So, yeah, so, but yeah, it's, I, yeah. <laughs> That's the, the human body is a is a is a tricky animal. It's got a lot of things that can can uh, make you think. That's for sure. So, Doctor William, are you yes, there? Yes, I'm here. Can I steal? Can I steal the doctor? You can. You, so you can always steal my my folks as long as I can steal yours. So, so okay. Doctor Doctor Halasa runs a parallel group to ours on Monday nights. So okay, okay. So, um, so um. Dr. Goodno, we can't thank you enough. This was, you know, fascinating. It's something that, you know, a lot of us, you know, don't know a whole lot about or, or you know, sort of touched on in the periphery. And we thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, and for those of you that are new here, 
Um, we're here every Tuesday night. If uh, if you um, are, like what you hear, um, uh, we are at aosrd.org slash webinars. We have over two years worth of um, uh, content lectures that we've uh, we've been doing for the last two years. Um, this is the kind of content that um, the AOA doesn't want want out. You know, we were canceled, as we mentioned when we started, <laughs> and uh, but we're gonna we, we're gonna persist. Um, so we thank you so much uh, for um, your time, and I'm going to uh, 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 twist your arm a little bit uh, in in a little while to to come back in a couple of months. Um, and maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more on the you know cholesterol levels and some of those things that you touched on. Um, yeah, let me know a little it's bit, a little bit deeper. Thanks, and, and again, we 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 really we really appreciate it. Um, next week, um, we have Dr. Brian Evans, who's actually from Reno, Nevada, like I am, and he is an interventional and integrative radiologist. So again, you know, uh, things we don't really hear uh, too much about, and he's doing some. Uh, very, uh, very innovative um, uh, uh, interventional uh, uh, procedures, um, and um, and uh, uh, so we'll, we'll, we're anxious to hear from him, uh, Dr. Mondragon. The link is AOSRD, AOSRD.org slash webinars. You can also get our our. Um, Full conferences are on there also on their slash conference or previous conferences. So, um, uh, so uh, and anybody else who would uh, aosrd.org slash webinars, um, like I said, there's well over two years worth of um, uh, lecture material there. Um, some of them have, a lot of them have uh, uh, narratives, text uh, with it, uh, slideshows also. Um, and um, anybody, uh, anybody who's new, um, you know, please join us. Um, Dr. Goodenow, again, we can't thank you enough. Um, we will be here again next week, same time, same station, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, and uh, if there's anything new on the, uh, on the integrative medicine front uh, in the AOA, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, so far, we're surviving without them. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're... Um, uh, we, we we're a little bit the uh, dearth when it comes to the CME credit um, accommodation. So just so you know, Doctor Goodno, we are AMA. We are the American Osteopathic Society for Rheumatic Medicine, Rheumatic Diseases. We are AMA ACCME accredited, but the uh, AOA decertified us. Okay. So, so um, I'm still having a hard time uh, I wrap my head around that one, but that that's that. Um, and uh, Again, anybody who's who's interested in presenting, you know, some material. These are not CME credits, so uh, you can talk about your products. You can talk about your, um, you know, your 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 you know your 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 research. Uh, we're not restricted to uh, in generic uh, um, uh, uh, issues, things like that. So, um, so, and we're always happy to uh, to uh, 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 you know hear from from everybody, anybody we can. Um, you're getting a lot of. Uh, Attaboys, kudos, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, huzzahs, thank yous. Uh, uh, one, uh, uh, Brad Zinga, I think he's he's part of your group, states that the lecture stirred is glia. So I like that. I, I might have to. I might. I might have to steal that one. I, that's, that's, well, that thank one. you guys. That's, You're very kind. that's pretty good. <laughs> so, again, um, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, Anybody else have any questions? We'll let you go. I know it's, uh, I'm not sure where you are. Are you in California? Yeah, I'm in Temecula, California. Just, okay. Uh, not so, too far from five hours. Well, Reno's a little farther, isn't it? Yeah, uh -huh. Reno, Reno's probably about eight hours. So, yeah. Um, but we get around. And, uh, and Bill, uh, uh, yes. This is Dr. Patel, and Dr. Dan also gives a very good lecture on autism mm -hmm. and the use of these products and, uh, um, you may like to also include that for him in the future. Okay. Well, we, we're we're definitely going to bother him to come back because he's got a lot of information that a lot of the things that I deal with. So, um, so, uh, and uh, we're we're always looking for the, um, you know, you know, you know, for 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 the next thing we can add to our uh, our repertoire. Um, and I got Brad Zinga says you're Hannah Montana's neighbor. So I'm not sure know. what that means, but I don't know who that is, but 
So I'm um, not sure. I, I that, that wasn't that some kid uh, actress or something. Actress, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I um I'm Miley Cyrus. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it turned into something else, I think, after that, after that. So okay. <laughs> she used to be a kid and not yeah. thought that for a kid though. Yeah, those things happen. So yeah, that's for sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, we'll have the, the 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 video up. Uh, usually it takes twenty four to forty eight hours to get it get it um, you know ready and, and to go. We'll have it up on our website. And um, uh, anybody again, anybody else? Um, I gave you my um, email. B o c t r b i l nine at gmail dot com. If you're interested, um, we can add you to our mailing list. So. I'll let you know about all about our um, you know, whatever programs we're running. And uh, Dr. Burgess, you have anything for us? No, just very thankful for Dr. Goodenow. That was great. Thank you. So, okay, Dr. Dr. Hartman, anything from you? Uh, no, no. I'm still uh, finalizing my presentation. I'll be giving on the 25th. Um, right. Based off my involvement in the prostate community trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'll be anxious to hear that because unfortunately I'm in that I'm in that uh, uh, age cohort now. So <laughs> so do well. Um, Doctor, how about Doctor Alasi? You got anything for us? Well, I want to see you Monday for sure. So I'm start promoting you, putting your. Yeah, start you, promoting. you have any, any other new picture? Any any one you send it to me? I've updated ones, you know. No, you know, you know. I'm not promoting it, it, you, man. As time as time goes on, I get I get more I you know get more and more um aged. So uh you know use the ones from the from the from when I was in my forties that they, they, they look better. So. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Okay, okay, so. Uh, so on Monday night, I'm in Dr. Halas's group, I'm going to be talking about the um, the new face of weight loss. So, mm. um, and uh, so some of the th some of the things we're doing in our office, and some of the, some of the newer, um, you know, some some of the new, newer modalities that are out, and some of the things we found that are that are that really been game changers. So, um, you know, we've been doing weight loss for 40 years, and I'll bring it to this group too. Um, it, I'm the fill-in when, when we can't find a speaker, but we've been doing really well here. We we're really, uh, you know, a couple months out um, and we've been that way. So, um, so I appreciate everybody's um, um, time, effort, and um, interest. And again, Dr. Goodenow, um, you know, please come back. Um, we, we have you on our, on our mailing list now. And uh, when you have time, uh, we'll be here every Tuesday uh, from now until we're not but yeah, I'll definitely, pop, I'll definitely pop in when I can. Yeah. This is fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, so Brian, Dr. Brian Evans next week is it integrative and uh, integrative uh, interventional radiology. So it's, it's again, I think something that most of us in this group, uh, we're not participants in, but um, it should be interesting. So uh, with that, um, uh, thank you all again so much. And um, we'll see you next week. Same time, same station. And Dr. Goodenow again. Great talk, and um, we'll definitely be be um, you know contacting you contacting you for some more information. Great, cheers, everybody. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you so much.